Hello and welcome to this webinar on Oracle Solar Suite 11G Performance Tuning, part of a series of webinars that C2P2 are doing uh, around performance of Oracle Solar Suite. This first webinar is Principles of Performance Tuning. So in this we're going to look at the basic processes and uh, thought process that you go through when performance tuning Oracle Solar Suite. Okay, so I'm Steve Millage. I'm a director in C2B2. And uh, so I'll be taking this webinar. This is, as I said before, this is a series of webinars, uh, a series of six webinars that we're doing over the next uh, few months. This is the first. Uh, the second in next week is looking at uh, Java Virtual Machine and the tools and techniques that there are to, to use to debug and performance tune the JVM. Essentially, we're going from bottom up within the Sour Suite stack. So we'll be looking at tuning and scaling WebLogic after the JVM. Then we'll move further up the uh, Sour Suite stack to go into Oracle Service Bus, uh, then Beeple, and finally we'll look into monitoring Sour Suite with Oracle Enterprise Manager on the 25th of February. So hopefully you'll be able to join us on a number of these uh, webinars. They'll also be recorded and available on YouTube after they've been broadcast. So let's look at uh, why we need to performance tune at all. If you look at uh, non-functional requirements on middleware systems, uh, you can see that reliability, availability, scalability and performance are prerequisites for functionality. So on any project, any SOAR implementation, these non-functional requirements should be priority one requirements. Essentially, it doesn't matter how uh, fancy the functionality that you have on your internal web systems or your internet facing uh, IT systems, if that functionality is slow, uh, slow to respond for users, uh, totally unavailable because it's crashed, or falls in a heap uh, when more and more users come to use your system, then it doesn't matter how good the functionality, if it's unavailable to users or, or unacceptably slow, then users are going to disappear. And in the fickle world of uh, internet, those users are very probably will migrate to one of your competitor websites or competitor services or in internal systems they can have major business impact or frustration for users so reliability availability scalability performance are prerequisites for functionality so in this webinar we're going to look more at performance and uh, the, essentially look at the process of performance tuning so ctp2 are a specialist in non-functional aspects of large service suite implementations. So our definition of performance is essentially how long does a single transaction take to execute? So what we mean by a transaction then is either a technical transaction, either as a sync, for example, a single database transaction within a SOA service or a business transaction within the system. So uh, potentially a whole SOA interaction involving multiple service calls coordinated through an ESB or not so much through a Beeple process, but through an ESB. And the reason this is important, as we said, faster performance leads to happier customers and faster performance can also mean uh, more transactions for the same level of kit and therefore a better price performance on the, on the hardware that you've purchased and the software that you've purchased. So as, as performance tuning pest specialists, we've done quite a lot of study on uh, performance in distributed middleware uh, or NTR architectures or SOAR architectures, uh, as they like to be called. And these are the uh, four main reasons that uh, you get performance problems within these systems. And there's, there's probably only these four reasons. And your job as a performance tuner or performance in troubleshooter is to essentially work out which one of these is causing the issues. So the four things are essentially raw algorithmic performance. So this is whereby 
uh, an algorithm that a developer's written doesn't scale to you know, production levels of data. For example, you know, the system was fast when uh, there were, say, 100 rows in a table, but is slow where there are maybe a million rows in the table. Uh, to be fair to most developers, these uh, performance issues are very rare in production systems. Most developers are good enough to determine that their algorithms uh, scale to the correct levels of volume. And most of these things would be picked up in system and, and development and test. So we, we don't usually see uh, raw algorithmic performance as an issue in many production systems. So we're really looking at the last three. So these are resource limitations. So essentially, you're running out of something on the box. Uh, and we classify, when someone says they have a performance issue, we classify this three. There's three things we try to, there's this sort of three tiers of performance that we're trying to look at. First, is it slow with one user? In which case, you do have a performance issue, probably a raw algorithmic performance issue. Is it fine with one user, but slow with, say, 100 users? In which case, you may have a scalability issue. However, if it's slow with 100 users, but you add twice the kit, and it's no longer slow, then essentially you just got a capacity issue and your system is inherently scalable and you just need to add more capacity. But if it's slow with 100 users, you add more kit and the system is still slow, then more than likely you're going to hit. You're hitting one of these scalability issues in your systems. And these are the main causes of scalability issues in uh, SOA and Java applications in general. So the first one is resource limitations, not enough CPU, disk or memory. Uh, the second is resource contention, so multiple users are trying to access the same resource and clashing and waiting for each other, so essentially being serialized through a resource, either through locks or file locks, database locks, synchronized blocks in code, it's the same resource contention. Or one of the biggest ones in obviously distributed SOAR applications is I.O. latency. So this is latency across the network, latency across the disk, or latency to access data in general. So if we drill a little bit into latency, this is one of the major factors in large-scale SOA, and it's the one that typically isn't taken into account very well in June development, uh, and hence is most prevalent in uh, production SOA app implementations. And we've all heard the standard phrase, you know, it was fast on my laptop, but it's not fast when it moves into production, and that will typically be due to latency. So our definition, or the definition of latency, is the time delay in requesting an operation and that operation being initiated. For example, the time delay in, uh, say, invoking a SOA uh, service and that service executing and returning the results. That's what that's essentially is latency. And there's many, many factors in latency. These are the most common that you will see in a SOA architecture. First is network distance, and that also integrates uh, like, as a sort of uh, three-way uh, combination of network distance, data size, and operation granularity that a SOA architect has to take into account when designing services. So network distance, for example, if you're invoking a service across uh, from one process running on your laptop to another process running on your laptop, then the latency of invoking that web service within uh, a service bus is likely to be in the order of sub-millisecond, hopefully in microseconds. However, when you start putting that service on a different host rather than a LAN, then you may be in a few, ten, few milliseconds to a few tens of milliseconds. As you move, say, across data centers, you'd be into multi-tens of milliseconds, and then as you move, say, across between New York and uh, the UK, then you could be into hundreds of milliseconds. So, you know, invoking these services will depend on the network topology. And, then, and this is where data size and operation granularity come into account. So data size is, uh, it's really the playing of the multiple factors. If, if you're designing a SOA service, do you uh, invoke many fine-grained calls where you pass maybe a identi few identifiers across to the service, or do you pass a huge piece of data that the service must operate upon and then give you a result? Uh, so the difference is, for example, if you have a 
say, a transaction or business transaction that needs to execute, you could either design that as, say, 10 fine-grained calls uh, or one call that takes a large quantity of data. And which is the best solution will depend on your deployment topology. For example, uh, 10 fine-grained calls, if they're co-located in the same JVM, is likely to take, you know, a few microseconds, maybe a millisecond. However, if those services, those services were deployed, say, across uh, WAN, across between uh, London and New York, then those 10 fine-grained calls could take 10 times a few hundred milliseconds. So you're into multi-second response times. And, and in that case, one call with large quantities of data is likely to be more efficient. So combined with network distance is network reliability. And we see network reliability coming more and more into play when we talk about mobile services. So if you have uh, users accessing your services through mobile phones, maybe RESTful services, then the latency can be quite large or the network liability can be quite poor on a mobile device. So you have no control where the client device is operating. So they may invoke a service on your uh, solar infrastructure and that uh, and at that point, they may disappear into a tunnel and sending the data back to them may go you know, at a rate of a few bytes per second. And therefore, the latency involved could be quite high and that could tie up large quantities of resources on your uh, solar infrastructure. The other obviously big latency factor is resource contention. As services queue up to access a resource, then they uh, will have to wait for all other invokers of that service to complete before they do and that could take a long time and finally one of the major obviously latency factors in java based systems is the jvm gc uh, typically a jvm will at some point do a stop the world pause and pause all threads within the jvm for a portion of time in order to do a garbage collection uh, and if that's tuned in correctly that portion of time may be many many seconds So how do we determine you know, all these different factors? And if, say, we're faced with a performance problem, how do we, uh, as performance tuning specialists, go about determining which of those three key factors is the causal factor in our case? Well, this is a process that, that we would recommend that you go through. Uh, often quite difficult to do in a production system with people uh, running around like headless chickens screaming and shouting that they have performance issues but this is uh, what I recommend that you do. The first is measure. It is essential that you have metrics. You can't determine uh, performance issues within uh, the cause of performance issues within production SOA systems unless you have data. Data is essential to determine the reasons for problems. So first you need to I'll get metrics onto your uh, SOA suite infrastructure or metrics out of your SOA suite infrastructure, information and data. And as we go through these webinars, we'll go through the various tools and techniques that are available to you to get this data. Once you have a set of data around the performance issue, preferably not just as it occurs, but leading up to the performance issue and hopefully afterwards, then obviously you analyze the data. And when you're analyzing that data, what you're looking for is evidence of the three causal factors that we talked about before, latency, uh, capacity, and contention. And we'll talk during these webinars of the techniques that you can determine which one of these is your, your main factor. Obviously, in many production problems, it's a combination of factors, and it's it's our job as specialists to determine which of these are the core, main causal factors. Once you have analyzed your data, you've come up with a hypothesis, say, of what the problem is. Maybe you've seen through thread dumps that uh, 20 threads are waiting on connections in connection pool, and your metrics of connection pool statistics show that there are a number of waiters, and you know, the max connections is maxed out all the time then you decide that from your data and your analysis that connection pool, you know, waiting for connections and connection pool is 
your your cause of your latency or your performance issues at which point you make that's your hypothesis and then from that hypothesis you decide to make a change so you determine what that change is and uh, for example in this case maybe we change max pool size to from 20 to 40 on a connection pool and then once we've done that change we do a test and using our metric data we measure the results of that test and determine whether we've had a good or bad impact on the performance of our system so if we in this webinar we'll just drill deep deeper into each one of these points so first thing is, is how do we measure well what we need in a production SOA system is effective service monitoring this is probably uh, one of the biggest problems that we see in production so as we applications is that there's no effective service monitoring and what do we mean by that is essentially many customers run so suite or so infrastructure or web logic without any good monitoring other than say running uh, nagios on a machine to tell them that they have C what their cpu usage and memory usage is on a linux host or windows host this obviously is not the most useful thing in the world for Java based infrastructure. So when we're talking about respective service monitoring in SOA infrastructure, what we're looking at, these are the sort of things that you should be thinking of measuring. There's many, many other things you can measure, but these are the key. First is on the service level, we'll be looking at, so this is individual service level, we'll be looking at service throughput, how many uh, service invocations are we processing per second, Concurrency, how many concurrent invocations of each service do we have? Uh, how many threads do we have running each service simultaneously? Uh, how many clients of these services do we have? What are the data volumes passing through? So what are the message sizes? Uh, what are the you know uh, what are the error rates? What are the response times for the service? That's key historical data, and that data should be gathered in real time and stored historically to, for analysis. Then on the sort of ESB infrastructure level in, it, in its own right, so for example in WebLogic we should be measuring the memory usage of WebLogic, uh, transactions, number of concurrent JTAs, database connections, if we have JMS, message queue sizes, uh, concurrent uh, backlogs in messages, backlogs on execute queues, uh, numbers of threads in use, there's many many uh, metrics we should measure within the WebLogic core infrastructure. Again, we'll go through during later webinars. And then what we haven't got on here, this slide is JVM level. We should be looking at JVM heap statistics, garbage collection times, uh, amount of logging messages. And I really recommend to gather as much data from as many subsystems as you possibly can. Uh, and then at, down at an infrastructure level, we should be looking at network utilization, how many bytes are flowing across each network interface, uh, what's the disk I.O. like on each disk, size of disks, uh, free space on disks, what's the CPU memory usage right down to each core level, uh, what's the operating system memory usage, uh, swap usage, virtual memory usage. Uh, and really you want to measure this real time and in historically. Uh, one of the things we we get one of the sort of criticisms we often get from customers is you know they say they can't can't afford to run uh, metrics on their production systems because they're running you know they they have a performance impact and therefore they switch them off this is really a sort of a bad excuse for not running monitoring if your systems are running so near to the limit that they can't cope with maybe a four or five percent monitoring overhead then you really really need it should add more kit because this level of data is invaluable in production systems uh, not just for performance tuning but also in the longer term for capacity planning I mean if you have graphs where you can correlate number of users on the system through network utilization and CP and disk usage then you have a good basis for capacity planning as well as performance tuning so once you have some data, when there is a performance issue, you can actually now have something to analyze to work out what happened. Essentially, you've got a flight recorder for your SOA infrastructure. So when we're analyzing, what we're looking for is evidence of uh, in that data of the three main performance cause, 
you know, causal issues that we talked about. So, you know, running out of resource, uh, resource contention or latency. So, for example, in our, you know, the thing I mentioned earlier, say around connection pools, what you'd be looking at is correlating different data metrics with each other to determine what the issue is. For example, in that, say, say you did have a number of threads waiting on a connection pool, you'd be looking, you'd be correlating connection pool, you know, free connections in a connection pool with uh, service throughput, with number of concurrent threads, with number of waiters on the connection pool. And you'd be trying to correlate that max connection usage occurs when, uh, you know, when, when, it, or when max connection usage occurs, then service throughput drops. And then once you have some correlations like that, you can go to sort of active tools to validate uh, these issues during a performance test. For example, in that case, you, you, would, you would start looking at thread dumps to see that you have threads that are waiting on connection pools live in production to prove to yourself that this is a serious problem. Uh, so you're basically looking at evidence for those three barriers of, of, of uh, performance issue. So once you have that evidence from your tools and your data, then you can make a serious causal hypothesis. Uh, and from, you know, that say connection pool usage is our problem. And from that, you can then obviously determine a fix that will mitigate it. And that fix could either be code or uh, application server or ESB changes. So when you do make changes in production systems, one of the biggest problems we see is that many customers in a flat panic uh, when they have performance issues change many things at once. Think of it as a uh, performance tuning as a scientific method. You should never change more than one thing at a time. Otherwise, you have no evidence that what you've done uh, is had an impact, or you don't know which thing you've done. It was the thing that you know, made the performance better. First thing I recommend is you look at configuration changes uh, within your application server infrastructure. Modern application servers like WebLogic have many, many tweaks and buttons and dials that you can press, turn and twist to get better performance. They are essentially do a lot of the work. The reason for existence for application servers is to do a lot of the infrastructure work in large scale distributed systems that you as a developer don't need to do when you write your code. So they have a lot of things around timeouts, concurrency threads, throttling, uh, connection pool sizes, memory, there's many things you could change and most performance issues that are not purely resource contention issues in code or databases can be solved by application server tweaks. Many, many times in a production system you're essentially hitting a throttling limit in an application server uh, and determining what that limit is and sensibly changing it a small amount can often uh, yield big performance gains. Only make changes to the code when you have evidence that it is a code issue. For example, if you have threads deadlocked in some Java code or blocking on a synchronized block and then code change could make that better, then obviously uh, make that code change when you have that evidence. But don't just randomly optimize code. Uh, take evidence. Even if you do have uh, say, multi-concurrency blocks on a synchronized block, there is ways in WebLogic where you can mitigate that through the use of uh, work managers to throttle concurrent usage of that. And actually throttling usage can sometimes increase performance by getting, getting better throughput. And finally, once you've made a change, always document that change. What we often find in production is that people have come across issues, they've fixed them in production, they change something in through the console, but there's been no back channel to, to uh, feed those changes back into the production builds. So the next time they do a release, then uh, those changes don't make it into the WLST scripts or however the WebLogic domains are rolled out, and the performance issues come back again. And... Uh, the system essentially builds up with a 
mythology that it's an unstable system and people become scared of doing releases often because they're just seeing the same issues that were solved once before in production but never made it back into the production builds so always document changes feed them back into your production rollout strategies for your uh, production domains uh, and ensure sure that they're there and finally if possible have the ability to create reproducible test cases uh, and then you can then test before in the staging environment before you make the change prove the production issue the performance issue is present prove that the change you made removes the performance issue and therefore you can gather evidence that the change has been successful now most customers that we see don't really have the capability to generate reproducible performance loads. Uh, we can provide advice on how to do that, but most people don't do it because it's quite expensive. Uh, not our advice, but the time and material times required to spend to build production test cases. But if you go to the largest uh, systems out there, then many of those system people who run those systems have spent a long time building reproducible production load values, recording sometimes actual traffic from production websites and being able to have the ability to replay traffic uh, through their server infrastructure so that they can have uh, reproducible test cases for performance and scalability testing. So I would recommend you do that if you get the opportunity and it doesn't get dropped off the end of the project uh, when time's tight. So what we're trying to do in those test cases is trying to produce graphs like this. So this is this is so a sort of uh, idealized view of what a of a typical service would look like. Uh, the green line is throughput. So as you add the number of users on the on the x-axis, the number of users increases, and then the throughput of the application goes up linearly, which is obviously showing linear scalability, and then essentially starts turning over on this case at around the 425, 450 users. And looking at the red line, that's the response time of the service through for a single user. We see that the response time is fairly flat and then starts as a knee again around 450, 500 users. This is very typical of a service that's hitting some sort of resource limit or a uh, concur or concurrency limit. And the only way you can produce a graph like that is possible to produce a graph like that in a test environment with the ability to ramp up numbers of users slowly across the system. And then once you reach a knee to investigate why that knee in the graph is there using your metrics uh, to determine you know, what is causing that performance degradation. That's, you know, having that test ability to create those test cases is, is really essential in, in performance engineering. Uh, and again, it's something that most customers, you know, never really, really achieve. So this essentially will prove that, you know, the scalability of your system. Every, you know, every system architect that I know will have probably been faced by the question from their manager, you know, if we double the number of users on our system today, uh, how much hardware do I need to support uh, that load? And most, you know, system architects probably put their finger in the air and guess. If it's double, then maybe they need double hardware. But that, you know, that can, without uh, a graph like this, then it's impossible for you to really know. Uh, it, so I would so I recommend you know, investing the time and effort in designing performance tests like this. Uh, and then running them over long periods of time. Many people we see performance tests over a short period of time to meet a UAT or a uh, requirement, uh, but then they don't run it for hours and hours on end. Many JVMs uh, and services need to be run soak test at high load for hours, because that's hopefully what your production systems will experience. So finally, so that that's you know the process that we go through uh, as performance test engineers. So uh, we're going to elaborate on that through uh, the next series of webinars. So first we'll be looking at JVM and we'll look at the how to measure JVM and the tools and techniques 
Then we go into WebLogic, Service Bus, People, and Sewer Suite with Enterprise Manager at the final. So hopefully you'll be able to join us at these webinars uh, through the next few weeks. And thank you for listening.